Welcome to Pixel Tunes Radio, episode 22. I am Mike. And I'm Ed. And this is our unreleased games episode. Yes. I am super psyched for this one. You don't even exist. That's, I know, I'm, I'm unreleased. You're unreleased. I'm just a prototype. You are a beta, my friend. <sighs> I'd rather be a prototype than a beta. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, obviously, there's games that sometimes slip through the cracks. And believe it or not, there's some games that have really excellent music, even though they never actually came out. Yeah, some games were only 30 or 40 percent finished. Sometimes games get to like 99 percent done before being canceled for whatever reason. Yeah. But a lot of times, the developers of those games, years later, will leak the data from the games onto the internet, and people will compile ROMs or a CD or what have you and allow those games to be played in an emulator. So today with us, we have a super special guest. He's also very interested in unreleased and prototype games. I think it's one of my passions. I love collecting these things. So Aaron, Aaron Hickman, the Aaron Hickman. From the Aaron Obscura, Hickman. The Aaron Hickman. Everyone there's, knows. There's only one on the planet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Aaron, why don't you say hi? Hey, how's it going, guys? We are doing well. Thanks for being on the show, man. No problem. So Aaron is from Retro Obscura, and he also guests on a lot of the Retro Junkies Network shows. So hopefully you'll be familiar with him. If not, definitely check out Retro Obscura. We'll throw a link up on our Facebook page. They're uh, a great little podcast. Aaron, do you want to talk about what you do on, on Retro Obscura? Yeah, so we just talk about old games, and usually they're obscure, and that's about it. <laughs> Basically. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's really not too much to it. You know, we have a preset format. We pick uh, a couple games to play, and then you know, sometimes we'll have like a guest on, like you guys. And, you know, it's it's a lot of fun. Just like you guys, you, you know, we pick out music or whatever, we put it all together. We get to discover things that we hadn't heard before, haven't played before, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. I like how Aaron makes it sound a lot more dignified than what we actually do. I know. We, just we kinda... do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, we do this epic thing, and it's amazing, and we pick apart things. And we're just like, hey, you guys want to hear a stupid song? Let's play some music. Here's hey, this some would time. make my... <laughs> make my mom really proud. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> so why don't we start off with our, our first track? Yeah, what is our first track? This one is from a game called Deadlock Ooh. for the C64. So this one, Aaron found, and I, I was really impressed with this with this music. Aaron, this was a cool track. Yeah, do you, why don't you give us a little background on this game? Okay, so this was going to be a System 3 game, uh, who I think they're most famous for, uh, they're like an independent developer based in the UK. Most famous for games like International Karate and Last Ninja 2 on the Commodore 64. So they really knew how to push the limits of the Commodore 64. And so this game was all set to come out in about 1990. And they'd even published some screenshots of the game. But from what I understand uh, is that things were just not going well in the development cycle. And so they just kind of had to can the game basically. And plus, it was late in the Commodore 64's life cycle anyways. <laughs> so yeah, uh, definitely. most companies were moving on to the Amiga, Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, those sorts of things. So uh, this would have really pushed the limits of the Commodore 64, though. Uh, I think Ed and I both got to play the demo of the game that was leaked yep. uh, years ago now. But uh, the animation is really smooth, and the backgrounds look really cool. And of course, the music is just out of this world amazing yeah there's like shades of super metroid and turrican and you know some of the later contra games all in there the running animation is like you know almost 60 frames per second smooth it's it's a really incredible piece of work for the c64 i just want to go back to the fact that when aaron said international i knew he was going to say something that wasn't house of pancakes but in my mind all i wanted <laughs> to hear was house of pancakes you just want ihop right now then right? Uh, you know it's morning okay over here it's 10 35 i don't know what time you people are listening to this but i want some pancakes i'm just saying so with I'm that thinking. said you'll make me some pancakes <laughs> yeah i'll make you some i had some pancakes this morning i'll make you some pancakes some e pancakes they'll be uh yeah they'll be interstate pancakes yeah do, it's not international i will 3d print you i will 3d print you some pancakes nice. yes nice we'll do some star trek uh food replicator and stuff to tie it all together the pancakes will be unreleased because he's going to give them to me in in the internet yeah yeah all right yeah that's what i'm thinking Man, we love going off the rails here at Pixel Tunes Radio. We sure do. <laughs> so, uh, who who wrote the music for this? It was Rain. Oh my God, I don't even want to try to pronounce this name. 
Sounds Rain like a Jedi Master. Rain, Owen, Rain Owen Hand? Is that, is that o, it's o, o, Owen? Let's Uwe. just spell it out. O-U-W-E-H-A-N-D. I would say it's that's like, Owen Hand. It's like I owe you a hand. Owe oh, you a hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be owe we a hand. Owe we a hand. Owe oh, we a hand. Owe we a hand. Owe we a hand. Owe oh, we a hand. Oh, hand. Oh, hand. Anyway, hey, so this music... <laughs> this uh, this song reminds me more of like modern chiptune than it does. I guess by the 1990s, that kind of chiptune sound that a lot of current chiptune artists kind of compose in was kind of getting popular anyway. So this, this, this is obviously nothing like a lot of the earlier C64 stuff. It's got, you know, a lot of huge arpeggios, a really kind of fat beat for, for C64. Uh, it's a really, really good track. The C64 had a very specific sound to it, though. I mean, you could hear a C64 track and be like, that's Commodore 64. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's no, like, that sound is so identifiable. It'd be like hearing a Nintendo song. Like, you, when you hear a Nintendo song, you know it's coming from a Nintendo. There's nothing in the world that sounds like it. But with C64, I don't know, was, you also, there's a very specific tone that a lot of songs took, and they sounded very, like, European. Uh, you well, can most tell of the composers for most of the composers were yeah. European, right? It's that uh, it's the arpeggio effect. So yeah. that's one key thing there that European composers love to use. And you've also got pulse width modulation, and so the sound is kind of morphing as it goes along. So if you hear like a long sustained note, you notice that unlike on like an NES game, it, those notes usually kind of stay the same as you go along. But on a Commodore 64, that sound kind of morphs and moves around a bit in your speakers that, that makes true. sense yeah. yeah like phases in and out almost look at this guy bringing all like technology professional and terms professional terms well and a, and a lot of those a lot of those composers that worked on the c64 like jerome tell and, yeah. and tim Foley, you know they brought those techniques onto the end the, the nes and That's kind true. of almost emulated those even though they weren't naturally capable of doing so road drivers that were capable of doing that true that true all right, Show. so we should probably get to the song, right? Let's let's blow it up. All right, so this is Deadlock. This is the main theme. Check it out, you guys.
Welcome back. That was a song. What that song was it? Oh my god! Well, it was Burning Fist for Striker. Yeah, that was it, the character select yes. theme. Um, it almost sounds like something Takushi Hayamura would put out. Definitely. Like it sounds a lot like like UC Cops. Yeah. Or uh, or Super R Type. It's got a very nineties. Yeah. I mean, it had Jack the nineties synth. Yeah. Sound to it. So that, that was song. a. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So it was uh, an unreleased Sega CD game. This was another one of Aaron's picks. So Aaron, why don't you give us a little history on this one? Well, as far as I can tell, this wasn't. Uh, it was originally set to be released in Japan. I want to say sometime around ninety four, ninety five. It was never released, but Good Deal Games, who's a publisher over here in America, they publish unreleased Sega CD games, and so they put out things like Citizen X. They've also put out some originals like Bug Blasters, <laughs> and uh, they got a copy of Burning Fist. I don't know where the subtitle Four Striker came from, but I think the original was just called Burning Fist. They got a copy of this beta, and they're like, okay, well, why don't we translate it and put it out? And they did. And so you can actually purchase a copy now. I think they still have it in stock. But yeah, I mean, the game itself, it was made by Sega of Japan. I don't know who the composer of that music is. It, yeah, I wish I knew because it's good stuff. I think you'd have to, maybe we just have to get to the end credits to find out. But I couldn't find any info online. But the game kind of plays like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Fighter's History. Which is kind of like a ripoff of Street Fighter 2. Yeah, I think Capcom actually sued Data East over that, didn't they? The Fighter's <laughs> History? Yeah, I want to say pretty they sure did. Pretty sure there was some sort of a lawsuit there that got I thrown out. I can't believe that they would sue them over something I, like I'm that. I'm pretty sure I remember it's, reading about that. Especially it, the since, music was so similar. I mean, if you think about it, though, like the whole thing with um, them, with SNK making fun of Ken. By coming yeah, out but that was like a friendly rivalry. Like, like yeah. Fighter's History and Fighter's History Dynamite like okay. really went after... Right. And it was more the gameplay that they were suing over, not not the music. That's true. But uh, you can't really put a lockdown on that. Well, that, that's why they threw the case out. Right. Because they, there, there wasn't... If they, were, if they were like actual characters named like Ryu and Ken and all yeah. that, then they, they'd have IP issues, but that's you true. can't sue over gameplay. No. That's kind of why Lords of Shadow was able to be made when it was a direct rip-off of God of War, you know? <sighs> I'm sorry I even brought that up. Why did you Mike just... is like getting red now. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Why? <laughs> Lords of hot garbage. I don't like it. Oh, man. Mad okay, hate. so. Mad hate. Uh, back to the, the, the game. I guess we were talking about the connection between this and Fighter's History. I would say this is kind of a ripoff of a ripoff, but it plays like uh, Fighter's History and also a little bit like, like a faster version of Eternal Champions, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it that. It's n nowhere near as complex as Eternal Champions was. Oh, you know, Eternal no. Champions was very kind of like almost strategy oriented in, in, in the combos and such. But this one's just kind of like, I don't know, I played through it once and it was pretty much like, it's the kind of game where jump kicks save you. You know, you just jump back and forth and keep kicking yeah. the dude and eventually he just goes down. Yeah, the AI is not very smart in this game at all when I was playing through it. And you can crank it up to nine and I was still able to just walk up to the guy and sweep the leg, you know, that sort punch, of thing. Punch, punch, kick, kick. <laughs> So, not much else to talk about with that game, but I guess we can move on to Drax Night Out. Yeah. This was, uh, this was a, a pumping game. Drax Night Out was a Parker Brothers game for the NES, which got canned just before release. It seems pretty complete. This is another one of Aaron's picks. We're doing all Aaron's picks first, it looks like, I think. Yeah. Aaron, why, why is Dracula on the cover of this game clearly wearing Reebok pumps? He looks like Grandpa from the Adams Family <laughs> first. Okay. And he's so, he's got these Reeboks on. Yeah, this is more like the Monsters version of Dracula. He's very happy. Well, no. So this was developed by a company called Microsmiths and published by Parker Brothers. And I think Parker Brothers got it through their head that, you know what, we need something to really sell this game. And this being the early 90s marketing uh, strategy, they decided, well, why don't we have Dracula have Reebok pumps? Because sure. kids love sneakers, you know? Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is actually a power-up in the game because the first part of the game is uh, you're escaping from Dracula's castle. There's all these townspeople trying to kill you, and you get a power-up called the Reebok Pump. And it's even featured, like, when you start the game, it's Drax Night Out featuring the Reebok Pump. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you put that thing on, and suddenly you're Sonic the Hedgehog, and you're, like, flying down the stairs. So it's pretty cool. Uh, the game itself, you know, once you get out of the castle, I was really surprised. It turns into like a, a huge open world game 
Like when you get into the town and you open up the map, you're just like, wow, this is a huge map. Hmm. That's <laughs> and there's tons cool. of places to go. Uh, it is it is a pretty complete game. You can play through the whole game. I've only played like the first couple of levels, but there's all sorts of little neat things in the game. Like you can set traps to kill people. You can suck people's blood. Uh, it's it's like uh, if, if GTA and, and Dracula had a baby, basically. Yeah, basically. Huh. It almost kind of reminds me a little bit of like Simon's Quest a little bit as well, with the open world and kind of like action-oriented stuff going on. Oh, yeah. And except for like the, well, the funny thing is the action stages are, you know, side-scrolling, 2D, that kind of style. And then when you get to the open world, it's more like Fester's Quest or something like that, where it's kind of like the overhead view. Hmm. Kind of how Blaster Master did that with like the, you know, the main part of the game was one way, and then you'd get to like the boss level, and it would f- flip to a top-down view. Here's an entirely new type of gameplay. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun game. I like Drax Night Out. I-, I didn't actually play it, but I watched some playthroughs on YouTube, and it does seem a lot of fun. So I might, I might check it out. The music's not too bad. Like this is my favorite track, and I think what I like about it so much is that it condenses a couple of ideas into a small space and yeah, I don't know it's just very catchy to me it's not like the most well written NES music by far but it sticks with you it's it's a good little rock track yeah it's a lot of fun and a lot of these games like specifically the games that we're playing today you know are, are games that didn't get finished but you can tell that the composers pretty much finished their stuff you know their work was done you know, I can only imagine how that must feel when you're when you've composed an entire soundtrack for a game, and then at the last minute they're like, "Uh, we lost our funding. Reebok pulled their pumps out." So well, actually, now we're not releasing. So I'm reading about this on online, and so this guy Mark Lesser, who I guess was working on the game in some capacity, I guess he developed it. Um, he actually said that they developed the game as consultants to Parker Brothers, and so as they neared completion. I guess what happened was Parker Brothers had insisted that they use Reebok as a sponsor by the, of the game by having Dracula wear Reebok pump shoes. I'm sure Lesser was very happy about that Oh, decision. yeah. So they were not. They complied, but the sponsorship was not enough to save the game, and it, it, was, it was completed, but it was never marketed. So the game is complete. It just was never put on. So Parker Brothers was probably like, dude, we don't have the money to put this out. Yeah. Let's find whoever we can to give us a little cash infusion that, you know, days before Kickstarter, man. So they had to look for a sponsor yeah. and boom, wasn't enough. So Yo, Reebok thanks, pumps thanks were Reebok awesome. for not even giving them enough money. I'm just saying Reebok pumps were awesome. If I had played this game, I would have totally went out and bought another pair of Reebok pumps. So the, um, <laughs> the commonality between this and, and Burning Fist is that we don't know who the composers are. I don't think there are any credits available for either one of them. So mm-hmm. it's unfortunate because it's a decent soundtrack. Yeah. Why don't we give it a listen? Yeah. yeah so here's I'm the main, for it. main theme from Drax Night Out. Main theme? Drax Night Out on the NES.
Steven Seagal has starred in countless action movies, kicking butt and saving the world every time. But can he star in a video game? Alright punks, come at me. Or uh, just stand there, make me come to you. Okay, take that. And that. And why do I only have one kick animation? Why can't I punch past the length of my own foot? This is absurd. Hello there. Ryu Ayabusa. Hey, how come your games are so awesome and mine, well, sucks? I hate to break it to you this way, Steve, but your game was cancelled. This whole thing is just a beta. The developers left you abandoned and unfinished. That's impossible. I'm Steven Seagal. I'm the final option. You're poorly animated and you look like a reject from a Mortal Kombat casting call. Look, I think I can help. Allow me to introduce Beta Be Gone. From the same team that brought you words be here, Beta Be Gone will finish your code while you wait. Give it a try. Take one teaspoon of this elixir. Give me that. If it's one tablespoon that makes a game good, the whole bottle will make it great. No, no, wait. Drinking the whole bottle will turn you into... Please enter your credit card number to buy more gems. Turn you into a free-to-play game. Well, I guess he's learned his lesson. Ninja, out. To access the ability to punch, please purchase five dollars in gems. Steven Seagal is the final option. Well, at least... His game is. Well, the game was out of options, but yeah. it never got released. <laughs> <laughs> that was a track called Alloy Processing Center, and man, that was really rocking. Yeah, it's got kind of a 90s industrial rock vibe to it. it. Like yeah. it a lot. Nice shuffle to it. Yeah. Nice shuffle beat. But the uh, the rest of the soundtrack's kind of... Not good. It's not, it's not, not it's as not good. good. Kind of almost reminds me of, like, you know, like Tommy Tallarico sometimes overuses samples. Yeah. Like, that, that kind of style of music, where they just try to do more with the SNES that it was really kind of capable of. Perfect example. There's a sample in there. There's like a hoo-ha, hoo-ha. There's like a yeah. lot of uh, whatever that martial arts style that Steven Seagal does. I think it's Aikido. Aikido, yeah. Fat yeah. Aikido. I, <laughs> well, and the other thing is like a weird <laughs> choir sample that's like, da -da! <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> yeah. This weird choir. This dude just found some presets on his keyboard and was like, this is great. <laughs> I think he Dog used uh, <laughs> the, the Tommy Tallarico song from uh, oh, Gladiators. Oh, Gladiators. Yeah, yeah where it's that all we played samples. from the first episode. You did I remember it. that. Cool. <laughs> and one of you really liked it. The other one was like, I hate this. Yeah, uh, it was my it with fire. God, so good. But it's funny because I'm going, I'm digressing a little bit, but you can actually tell, like, now that everybody knows what Tommy Tallarico's voice sounds like, you mm -hmm. can tell that that's Tommy Tallarico and those samples saying, oh, going, cool. you did it. Yeah. Cool. So this was done by Fred Porter who has been a recording engineer and music producer in Tucson since 1975. He worked for RSP in the 90s and composed the music to Bobby's World for the SNES, which never got released. That had uh, a really good rendition of the Bobby's World theme, actually. Cool. Yeah. The SNES actually, version? Yeah, actually some of the music in that is really good, and that was also a game that never came out. Cool. Yeah. We'll have to put something like that on the Facebook page, maybe some yeah. Bobby's World. Definitely. I used to love that cartoon when I was yeah, a kid. Yeah, me too. Hey, Bobby, don't you know his mother? <laughs> like with the Minnesota accent. Yeah, yeah. She was, she was fantastic. And their name was Bobby Generic. and Generic. Generic. He'd be like, that's Generic, but everyone would call him Generic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he also did Steven Seagal as the final option, obviously. That was unreleased as well. The only game he did which did get released, which I can tell maybe this is why Porter only did three games because two of them didn't get released, yeah. was Beethoven, the ultimate canine caper. Oh. You know, oh, best game man. in the world. Best game ever best movie <laughs> so yeah not a very good track record as far as licensing goes for uh for mr porter the game itself very unfinished it's got digitized sprites similar to mortal Kombat, mortal Kombat with about a third of the animation involved street fighter the movie the yeah movie, and the, the enemies just kind of right. meander about and stand around like the ai wasn't programmed in yet so actually the game is finished that's just how Steven Seagal wanted it to be. I mean, that's pretty much the way his 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 foes were in a lot of the movies. It was just like <laughs> just I'm gonna sit around. here and wave my knife around, yeah, until you attack me. So there's some Steven Seagal movie that he's in where he dies in the first like five seconds. 
it's not actually starring him. Like he's just in it. Mm. And it's like under siege or something like that. And Ooh. like he's on a plane and he ends up getting sucked through a plane engine. And it's like really funny because it's Steven Seagal dying in like the first five minutes of the movie. That reminds me of what was that Bruce Lee movie? What's it? Enter the Dragon. Mm -hmm. And I think Jackie Chan is in there for like five seconds getting his yeah. butt kicked. Yep. yep. <laughs> Chuck Norris was in that movie also. That's right. Yeah. And he true. lost. Which never happens impossible. anymore. Yeah. Oh, this game would have yeah, been amazing. So so, well, well, Steven Seagal, I mean, Aikido, the actual martial art, yeah. is there aren't any offensive attacks in Aikido. It's all based on Defense, having the right. enemy come to you yeah. and countering their attack. So to base a video game on Aikido is kind of weird. Like, you would need to have enemies that would literally, like, come to you. you they, I think there's, like, one basic kick and one basic punch in Aikido. So maybe that's why he only had one basic kick and one basic punch throughout the entire game. Maybe it was actually going to release like that. That would have been awful. That would have been terrible. Yeah. Maybe that's why I got canned. Maybe maybe Seagal was like, dude, you can't make a video game based on me. I don't that... I don't actually attack anybody. It's yeah. all it's all parry. It's all combo co 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 breaker. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. So yeah, that was Steven Seagal. Yeah. Final option. Yeah. Yeah. The ROM is available, so you can actually if you got a uh, super everdrive or you know, if you really hate yourself, if you really you hate yourself, you can actually you can actually play the game in an emulator yeah, yeah. or, or, or if you hate your yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey guys, why don't we come over? You can play the Steven Seagal game. Here, come here, sit down. I need to show you something. Oh, what are you gonna show me? The final option. Jerry, you're a jerk. I'm never coming over again. <laughs> so the next game <laughs> is X Men Mind Games for the 32X, and yeah, man. And, and so this is. The track that we're going to be listening to is Track 2, also known as Level 1, which doesn't really make much sense. It's basically the game that played... Well, Track 1 is the title screen. Oh, why don't they theme. just call that title screen, then? Look, man, I don't know. I don't do this stuff. I don't you do You think this. I know about game music? I just sit here and let you talk. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm no expert on this ah. stuff. So tell me about X-Men Mind Games. Jesper Kidd. If you don't know who Jesper Kidd is now, he's all over the map. Like he did most of the Assassin's Creed games music wise, but before that, like in the nineties, he was involved in the, the demo scene. And a lot of those scenesters from that time got picked up by this developer whose name's escaping me. But they went on to form Xyrinx, and Xyrinx or Xerinx made a few games like Subterranea and Red Zone, and they developed The Adventures of Batman and Robin. And so Jesper Kidd did all the music, and he had a very unique sound engine. And so, in, to my ears, it really pushed the limits of the Genesis uh, capability-wise. And it sounds you know really unique. And so, I know that Xyrinx, Zy Xyrinx, whatever, had put out like a demo for the 32X, and I think was them working on this canceled X-Men game, which would have been, you know, you can watch videos of it, but it would have been like a 3D game with these pre-rendered sprites, I guess you would say. Yeah. It looks really interesting. I mean, it at the stage, it got canceled. It doesn't look like much fun, but it looks like it could have turned into a decent game. But just like anything on the 32X, you know, very limited lifespan for that system. And so things were getting canceled left and right because... People just weren't buying the 32X like Sega thought they would. Um, you no. know, I had one as a, I had one as a kid, and I loved a few games on it. You know, I had Doom, um, Star Wars, and Cosmic Carnage. Yeah, I had all but, those. Uh, Doom. I think everyone had Doom. <laughs> and, <laughs> you had a 32X. Like you had game. Doom. I mean, yeah. that was the most recognizable title on the whole. Yeah. Well, in Star Wars Arcade too. That's true. Because that was a game that Sega really heavily touted at the beginning of the 32X launch. In virtual. Yeah, race. it was actually. Uh, yeah. So little known fact about that Star Wars game, it was actually based on a really rare arcade game that Sega put out yep. uh, in the mid-90s. And I think there were only like 12 that made it over to America. Wow, so, that's crazy. Yeah, pretty huh. nuts. Hmm. But yeah, you know, it's sad that, that X-Men got cancelled, but at least we've got some sweet tunes to listen to. Jesper Kid, he's always does this like this dark techno y electronic Very sound. Dark industrial, yeah. I mean his sound back then was almost identical to like 
early 90s industrial, like early Once Scott, How Job, Frontline Assembly, all those all those bands. I mean, his music was almost indistinguishable from from real like commercial 90s industrial music. So I, I, I was absolutely influenced by those bands. And it just amazed me how awesome his music sounded on the Genesis back then. I think the Batman and Robin soundtrack was definitely I my was favorite of say, them all. Yeah, no. um, and that was a completely different game than the Super Nintendo version, actually. Yeah. That, that was back in the day when you could have the same game in terms of the name, yet the two games would be completely different, like Aladdin and Adventure, you know, This Adventure is a Batman and Robin game. The Super Nintendo version was very, very much focused on being like episodic, like the cartoon. Oh, very, it followed the yeah. cartoon's thematic like, yeah, uh, it's crazy. scenes almost 100%. And the music was very not Konami of that era. It was very like cinematic yeah. and, and more like boisterous and booming. Yeah. Whereas this music, I would say it's just straight up techno. I mean, this is just like a Contra game where you're just going through throwing boomerangs at like everything that moves. And <laughs> it's a really boomerangs. good game. Yeah. And it's a really good game, actually. Yeah. Uh, both of the games are excellent. So The other really thing about cool. Just for Kids music from, from back in this time was that his music was long. <laughs> like, yeah. tracks would go I for bet. seven, eight, nine minutes sometimes, and they would be kind of repetitive, but he would always introduce new keyboard sounds, new themes, but that, that same driving beat would pretty much lay behind the entire track, and then he would just overlay like lots of cool stuff behind the whole thing. So this track actually goes on for, I think, seven minutes and 30 seconds or something Jeez. like that. So we're going to probably fade it out a little bit. Now, it. One... Once it gets a little repetitive, but... Yeah. One thing I wanted to mention about the 32X was it actually had superior sound capabilities to the Sega Genesis, but because the sound design, I think it was called Q-Sound, was so poorly documented by Sega that most developers ended up just using the Genesis sound chip. And so I want to say that this game is the same way. I think there's a little bit extra sound-wise going on, but I can't really hear much else. Yeah, I think I think this only used the YM2612. This one in Cosmic Carnage, I know for sure, only used the 2612 chip, simply because, well, getting a little technical here, but if you, if you log the music via like an emulator or something like that, if it used the extra chips, you wouldn't hear those instruments when you play back the, 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 the VGM file. So, but this one, when you log it through an emulator, you actually hear every single instrument. So I know it's just 2612 only. Which is pretty Nerds. impressive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nerding out over here. But you know, it, it is so pretty cool. impressive because you, you, you might not think that listening to it because just the way he was able to manipulate the sounds, you know, like to me, this sounds like a, a Hong Kong action movie. That's what the sound yeah, kind of Yeah, yeah, I can definitely that. hear that. All right, so, so let's, let's hear that. Let's get on with that yeah. show. X Men Mind Games. This is again track two, level one. From Jesper Kid.
Space Queens. <laughs> queens of space. Space and in the Queens. Queen in the space. It's queen in your space. Queens New put, York. Put my queen in, in space. Your, queens New York in space. Put my queen in your space. That would space. be an awesome video game. So the game was Sonic Extreme. And I know a lot of people really wanted this game to come out. So the song, of course, is called Space Queens, which we've very clearly identified. <laughs> and this game was supposed to come out on the Sega Saturn and the PC. Yeah. It was, uh, as far as the Sega Saturn, I mean, this was like supposed to be the headlining Sonic game. There was a lot of confusion and development heck with this game. Yeah. So originally, I think it was slated as a Saturn game, but then later on, similar to back in the day, the 3DO Corporation actually released like a PCI card for the computer mm. that could play 3DO games using the regular CD-ROM drive. So they were going to do something similar, or they did something similar for the Saturn, I think, but it was only dev boards mm. called the NV1. It was a partnership between Sega and NVIDIA where you can install this board into your computer and then you can actually play like direct Sega Saturn ports for your computer. That's cool. And so at the, I guess at the end of the development cycle, Sonic Extreme was supposed to be only available for this NV1 card. But there are dribs and drabs of data from regular Saturn builds and NV1 builds and all this Sonic Extreme craziness that it makes it really hard to kind of dig through and figure out what the game was actually supposed to be because it got reiterated so many times over its lifespan. I've heard that the creators got sick or somebody got sick or went nuts making this game or like was health wise. I, mean, I go was, nuts considering what happened with it. Well, yeah, there was a I lot of back that, and forth. Uh, Yugi Naki or Yuki Naki, who's the original developer of Sonic, he um, developed it. Yuji yeah. Naka? Yuji Naka. Y Yuji, yeah. 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 He developed an engine for Knights. And yep. so they were originally using that engine from the boss levels for the game. And he and caught wind out. of it. He freaked out. Yeah. And so, like, so they you had. You can't to... use this engine. What do you do? Yeah. And like, that's oh after, God. like, a year and a half of work. Uh, so this is, like, Sega Institute over in America making this Sonic game. Um, and they were known for, like, they'd made. They'd worked on, I think, Comic Zone, The Ooze. Kid Chameleon, Sonic Spinball, and uh, here they were told, nope, can't do it. All your work out the window, because Naka was actually threatening to leave Sega if they continued to use his engine oh, on Sonic so Extreme. That's ridiculous. Like, that, that's what it got to, and mm -hmm. I mean, whatever. I mean, he wants to protect the work that he made cool, but yeah, I mean, within people within a company fighting like that can't, Well, that's you're not going to have a successful business. Well, you that's know? what's caused Sega to go under. It wasn't Nintendo. It wasn't Sony, really. I think it was just really, really poor decisions. A lot of infighting. And internal fighting between Sega of America and Sega of Japan. And like there was so, like, especially with the Saturn and the Dreamcast and the 32X and just that whole like era, it was just like <laughs> Sega of Japan being like, well, we're going to do this. And Sega of America was like, wait, wait what? We're, we're doing that now? Uh, uh, okay. All right. And, and I kind of feel like Sega of America just didn't have a shot at yeah. trying new things. There was a big cultural barrier, the communication yeah. between the two offices. I mean, that even happened a bit with Nintendo. Back in the day, I remember hearing reports that, you know, Nintendo of Japan wanted to do something and Nintendo of America was like, no, that's, that's never going to work over mm -hmm. here. But the, yeah, the same thing with Sega. But I think in terms of Sega, Sega of Japan was a little less willing to bend and listen to Sega of America than Nintendo of Japan was mm -hmm. to Nintendo of America. So funny, Sega yeah. was made. I think Sega was formed by Americans. Yeah, <laughs> originally, yeah. and yeah. then sold to uh, sold to people in Japan. That's what Sega means: service and games. S E G A. That's what the original. That's why it's called Sega. Yeah. But you know, nowadays, like like people like Kaz Hirai and Iwata and Miyamoto, they they. They know more about American culture. Yeah. Like Harai actually spent time in America, you know, in the PS3 division. So they know how both sides of the business work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where they learn their lesson that you can't have these two cultures clashing. You know, you need to know what's gonna work for both, and then you need to know what's gonna work individually in each of their cultures. Well, so even when Nintendo that's why started more successful. And I think that's why Microsoft is having issues in Japan. Yeah. Because they're oh, primarily absolutely. an American they company. They just don't get it. They don't get and, it. And you, know, you can release all the Vocaloid stuff that you want over in Japan on the on the Xbox and get some stuff there. But as a whole, 
your games are designed for an American audience. Yeah, and there are very, very few gamers in Japan that are gonna, you know, really go after that stuff. Which is interesting because. I mean, me personally, I'd much rather play a game that came from Japan than uh, play a game yeah. that came and from the, America. Unfortunately, I think we're the minorities now. I mean, back I in the day, in NES and Super Nintendo games, Japanese games were where it was at. Yeah. But nowadays, it's it's Call of Duty, you yeah. know, it's Madden, it's, it's the stuff made by Activision and Electronic Arts and the American companies that are really doing the AAA titles. Japanese or, companies. Or Europe, you know, like Ubisoft. Japanese companies just got lazy, I think. A lot of it is they just got lazy and they stopped being creative and they stopped coming up with this wacky changes. I also think, in all honesty, that 9-11 had a lot to do with, with how gamers game. Because if you think about it beforehand, Call of Duty and, and Medal of Honor, those were definitely like minority games. Like, like mm. not a lot of people played those games. Like there was an audience for it, but it was mainly on the PC. And I think a, a lot of what happened was uh, people were just looking for, I mean, you know, you got a game where you're basically defeating terrorists. Like that is straightforward, yeah. like glorified military. That was the climate you know, in America. Right, at, at exactly. Point, so. And we just want revenge on the terrorists. So. All right, so after getting way off track, let's get a little <laughs> back on topic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Space Queens. <laughs> Space Queens was written by Chris Sen, and then Howard Drossen was, I think, the executive producer behind parts of the game. Yeah, he, yeah I know he had worked on the music for Comic Zone, which is awesome. And I think, like, even the music in this game, it wasn't really going to be the the finished music in the game. Right. I think it was, it was more like for, like, holding. idea and prototyping. Yeah. And it does but work one, well. I mean, it's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. This, this track is probably my favorite track out of the unreleased music from the game, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of, like, New Order, uh, a little bit of Eurasia, kind of just like that Euro European nightclub <laughs> feel to it. Yeah, with those pulsing bass lines and the laser synths and all that stuff. Yeah, definitely. So our next game is called Secret Ties. This is an NES game that never came out, ever, uh, which is a shame because it's actually pretty cool. I've played through it myself. This track is called Incan Temple, and the game's soundtrack was created by Fumito Tamayama. I call this game Mega Gaiden. Mega Gaiden. I tried to play through this game without using a code, mm. like the because there's a way to enter in like a specific like debug code so that you basically don't get hurt. Mm. And I tried to play through this game without entering that code. Oh man, this game is difficult. I mean, like if this game came out the way that it did. Which, I mean, it's finished. You can play through the game, you can beat the game, but if it came out the way it, it, it was, nobody would have beaten that game. Yeah. It was just too difficult. And all your attacks were very, like, close. Like, you had to be right next to somebody. There was no distance. So you had, like, punch kicks, whatever. It's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. <laughs> you test you're sure to find. Right? The things that teach you. You're sure to beat you. Here's a lesson. So listen to teach you now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, basically, uh, this game was developed by Vic Tokai. And, that uh, Vic. That Vic. He's a great programmer, yeah. Mr. Tokai. Yeah. <laughs> Vic Tokai, the company. <laughs> this guy. So, Secret Ties is pretty cool. It, it, actually, I believe it's based on a manga. It's, it looks like it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the plot is pretty ridiculous. You're basically this this guy it's named Silk. It's almost like Silk. an early Tomb Raider kind of deal. Yeah, a little bit. Your play is this guy named Silk, which, whatever. And you go through, uh, basically, from level to level, you're, you're hunting for this treasure that this guy wants you to get. And basically, the reason, the way that he gets you to go hunt for this treasure uh, this all-powerful treasure is he kidnaps your girlfriend. So there's a lot of like... I'm gonna take a girl, I get yeah, my stuff, yeah. and you can get it back. Basically, yeah. And she's very... Like Gogo 13. It does. He, he, yeah, the main character looks like Gogo 13. And it basically plays like if if Ryu Hayabusa from the, from the original NES Ninja Gaiden series got dropped in Mega Man levels. Yeah. Like that's what the vibe I get from the game. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty standard of most action platformers back then. Uh, you know, it rips off Ninja Gaiden, Vic, uh, Vice Project Doom. I must have said Vic Project Doom. Um, and, uh, you know, Journey <laughs> to Silius and, like, all these types of games that just ripped each other off. Speaking uh, of rip-offs, yeah. this music. Yeah, the music. Uh, <laughs> Castlevania much? Yeah. Uh, definitely sounds like Bloody Tears from Castlevania 2. So uh, if you're not familiar with what that song sounds like, go back and listen to our Castlevania episode because it's the second track. But it was written by Fumito Tamiyama, who's actually 
has a lot of video games under his belt. Yeah. What's he got? He's got like stuff like Psycho Fox on the Master System. Uh, he did Power Mission for the Game Boy. Okay. Which is really good. Decap Attack on the Genesis, which has a great soundtrack. He's also more recently done stuff like Coral Q on the PS1, okay. which had a notably good soundtrack. And Hot Dog Storm for the arcade. Yeah, we've Hot got Dog a friend Storm. who has that game. He has yeah, the board. Yeah, it's, it's a really good vertical shooter. Hot really dog, like it's called Hot Dog Storm. It's called Hot Dog yes, Storm. Yes, you have to feature the music from that game. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. he actually wrote the, um, the sound driver for that game, not okay. the actual music itself. But the, it had a really beefy sound to it, so it was really good. He did the Game Boy port of Samurai Showdown. Oh, boy. Did you guys ever play Socket for Genesis? It was a Sonic ripoff. Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the, the dude that was like an electrical plug kind of deal? Yeah. yeah I it remember sounds that. like Plug Man. Or plug Pulse Man. Man. Pulse Man. From Mega Man? No, Pulse Man. Pulse Man. Oh, yeah, that's right. Like you had the little thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. game that was developed by um, uh, Game Freaks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he was more about like a humanoid kind of character. Sort of. Yeah. yeah. Socket was kind of like a cartoony, much more cartoony looking. Okay. Yeah. This more is a good game. game. So, yeah, go ahead and check out Secret Ties. This song, again, is called Incan Temple. It's not Bloody Tears. And it's not Bloody it's Tears. It's not Bloody Tears. Even though you may think it's Bloody Tears. We swear. It's not Bloody Tears. Okay. Just keep listening. And it's not Family Ties, either. It's not no. Family Ties. It's, and it's not too many cooks. Secrets. <laughs>
Coming up on the next episode of Corneria Diaries, we hear a candid tale about Falco Lombardi's kleptomania. Fox McCloud spills the dirt on his sorta of best friend. Heh, <laughs> I don't know why he does it, but it's always the strangest things. Spoons, stalks of celery, heck, one time he stole a lapel pin off of Peppy's jacket. So weird, right? Peppy makes some very obvious observances about Slippy Toad and shares a startling secret about his credibility. I know what you're thinking. Why does Slippy fly so awful? Slippy was hired in as a tech only, but General Pepper was sauced when he signed the contract, which Slippy had conveniently adjusted to include being an Arling pilot. To break the contract would cost too much, so we gave him some rudimentary flying lessons. And that's when the pain began. Come on, guys! Get this guy off me! I'm toast if I don't get some help! Fudge! Fudge! No, me! Me! I'm done! Couldn't that stupid frog save his own behind? He's what made me retire as a pilot. Well, that and the whole Crystal fiasco. Finally, Falco delivers the dirty story of Fox and Crystal, and a tawdry tale of arguing and lovemaking. Look, Fox and Crystal fight one minute, then canoodle the next. We're all sick and tired of it, but at least he's tied down to just one woman. One of our missions had to be canned because he kept boffing the female fighter pilots, Miu and Faye. I'm telling you, man, dude gets more tail than me, and I'm a freaking giant bird over here. This and more on the next Corneria Diaries, Wednesday at 10 p.m., only on the Nest Network. Nest Network! Do a barrel roll! <laughs> Star Fox. That was from Star Fox 2. That was a track called Macbeth Inside. Yeah. And that was dumb. That sounds <laughs> really... dirty. I'm sorry. I know, right? Oh, that's so Like Shakespeare so... just like totally went off the rails. <laughs> the uncut Shakespeare. Yes. So, uh, I... where do we start with Star Fox well, 2? I mean, uh... Star Fox 1 came out and it was actually done uh, by, I believe, Argonaut Games. Right, uh, which was a, a European developer. Um, I've, I've actually done a lot of reading on this uh, in Retro Gamer. Um, they had an excellent interview uh, way back in the day with the guy who uh, basically did this. So basically, what what happened, what went down, is uh, Star Fox One came out, and uh, the whole reason why it came out was they were looking for an engine for a flying engine specifically, and I guess um, this developer. Uh, was working with Nintendo and so they kind of like flew into Japan and they showed them like stuff that Did would eventually become roll? Star Fox. Yeah, they showed them how to do a bar barrel roll awesome. basically, yeah. So Star Fox 1 was hugely successful for Nintendo and so they were like, great, let's make another one. Let's make Star Fox 2. So production started on the Super Nintendo. They were working on it, working on it. And right before the game, I mean, they showed it off at the CES, which was I think right before E3 started, they, they were doing CES. What eventually ended up happening with Star Fox 2 is they just canned it. And what's funny is Nintendo was like, no, it's coming out, it's coming out, and they kept saying it's coming out. And in the background, they were like, we're canning this game. Like, we're canning it, we're moving all development over to um, the 64. I believe this upset Argonaut Games because I don't believe that they worked on Star Fox 64 at all. I think that was all in-house Nintendo. And so, but I believe that Star Fox 2 was Argonaut Games, and so they kind of, it, I believe it kind of soured the relationship because they poured their heart and soul into making a sequel, and it never came out. So, a lot of the ideas from Star Fox 2 actually did make its way back into Star Fox Command, yeah. which came out for the, D, the DS. Really, really good game. Have you played it? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, it's an excellent game. Um, so like the stuff where you would draw on the map to like strategically move the missiles and stuff, all of that was done through, um, and and the game had multiple like endings and stuff. Awesome game. Like Star Fox Command is where it's at. For yeah, Star Fox I mean, games. It, I think it was so polished because a lot of those, a lot of the groundwork for those ideas had been already fleshed out for right. the Super Nintendo version. And Argonaut Games did work on on Star Fox Command, I believe. So. That's kind of how it all went down. There you go. Yeah. So, the, but this track was uh, composed by Mary Yamaguchi, which is strange because she's mainly Capcom. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why they pulled her in, but uh, yeah, she worked on the game's soundtrack. Really good job. 
And uh, so she did what, like Street Fighter 2 and... Well, she did Street Fighter 2 for the TurboGrafx-16, right, but right. she we just played a track from her from Super Ghouls and Ghosts That's for right. our spooky tunes episode. Spooky. Yeah. Spooky. And, 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 and your favorite shooter, UN Squadron. Yes! Love me some UN Squadron. And some Mary Yamaguchi. Chocolate rain. I would marry her Yamaguchi. Oh. <laughs> Sit up. I quit. <laughs> flip the table, table flip. again. Table flip. So let's talk about our next game. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you didn't really talk about how the game plays for Star Fox 2. Like the free roaming, I haven't played it, 3D environments. Thanks for reminding me. Oh. <laughs> well, you should it's, play it, man. Yeah, you should. And it's got like these cool little areas where, and I think Star Wars... Star Trek, ah, what am I thinking? Star oh, Fox 64 yeah. borrowed. Wow. You know, like the whole like thing where your jet would morph into like an armored tank or like, what do you call it? A Japanese robot almost. A mech. And so you'd walk around like a mech. Yeah, you'd walk yeah. around these levels. And uh, yeah, it was free roaming. You weren't on rails like in the original Star Fox. Star Fox. <laughs> Fox. Yes. Well, they called it Lilat Star Wars. Thing, right? Star. Yeah, Lilat Wars. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And they called it Lilat Wars, which... Why did they do that again? Was Star that Fox a, was already copyrighted was it a TV in, show or something in in Europe? It was yeah, I think it was either a t it was yeah. a kids TV show or yeah. something like that. Apparently, they got the rights back though for some of the later releases. Like I think Star Fox Command and Star Fox Assault wasn't it Assault for GameCube? Yeah, Are you sure it wasn't a Pepper? A well, pepper? so no. in the Argonaut also. The whole reason I think Star Fox came out was because Argonaut had made this game together with Nintendo on the Game Boy called X. It's just hmm. called X. And okay. it, it was like a 3D wireframe tank game that kind of set the course for how Star Fox was going to be made. And so. And that was, and that was Game Boy? That they yeah, did that wireframe? was Game Boy. Wireframe. Wow. You got to check it out. And it's it came about, out. Uh, it came out in Japan. Yeah, you okay. can check it out. And it's nice. pretty cool. But they originally worked on an English prototype that never came out over here. And then Nintendo was like, well, can we do something like that for the Super Nintendo? And so um, Argonaut, before that, had made this series of games called Glider. And so Glider had used like those 3D effects that looked really nice. And so it was going to be called like Super Glider. And so you can check this out on YouTube. But there's a demo of Glider for the Super Nintendo. And that's kind of what became Star Fox, like using some of that technology. Cool. Now they did not know. Yeah. And I think the fact that, that Star Fox 2 also used the Super FX2 chip, which I I know was not cheap to manufacture, was probably one of the major contributors to the fact that mm -hmm. it never got released because those cartridges just would have been too expensive to manufacture, that's especially true. when you're moving all of your budget into N64 development. Yeah, I still think it would have been really cool if they released it. I mean, oh, just like one last hurrah for the Super Nintendo. Even as a limited release kind of deal. Oh, yeah. Star Fox 2 should have come out, but it yeah. didn't. And that's a shame. I mean, the game was hugely advertised and marketed in, in Nintendo Power. I mean, I remember Game reading Pro. about it. Yeah, and Game Pro too. Yeah. So speaking of awesome finished games which never came out, our next game <laughs> is Rescue for the Genesis slash Mega Drive. And let's be clear, that's R-E-S. Capital Q. Capital Q. Like NyQuil. <laughs> <laughs> this one had a soundtrack from the amazing Matt Furness, who has written tons and tons of excellent games out there. I really, really love this soundtrack. I think it's it's some of Furness's best work. It's good stuff. So the game itself is about rescuing space miners from space mines. So you kind of, it's almost kind of plays like a little bit like Solar Jetman in terms of gameplay where you've got a jetpack. It's a side scroller. So you enter in this level in your giant rescue ship and you've got to find a appropriate place to land your vessel. And then you hop out of your vessel and then you've got to traverse some dangerous dudes. Traverse some dangerous terrain. dudes. Traverse some dangerous ter terrain. Thank you, Aaron. I was going to say dudes because I think that's better. Be, you'd be traversing dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Traversing those dudes in the justice. <laughs> Got to do them in the justice. Nest? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to traverse some dangerous dudes, dudes, and dangerous <laughs> terrain to get to the miners that you need to rescue, and then you've got to bring those miners back, but at the same time keep those miners safe. So the miners kind of follow your every move. They kind of clone your jumps and your your movements. Kind of like baseball so you've stars. got to 
if you're jumping over a pit that has like a little fireball leaping out of it, you've got to time your jump so that not only you, but the miner following you gets over that pit without getting hit by that little fireball. Because if he dies, then he goes back to where he came from, and there's a little RIP sign where he comes from. you got to go back and grab him again, and I think you only get like two or three tries to grab a miner before he disappears completely, and then you don't get credit for rescuing him in the level. See, when you're talking about if following, are we talking about uh, like following the patterns of your movement like in Baseball Stars, or are we talking more like... Uh... More like they follow behind you and just mimic, mimic your moving. Follow behind you okay. and mimic your movement. Like right. Sonic and Tails, like that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But even even more so, almost like like the um, ah, like the clones in Ninja Gaiden, the orange clones. Oh, okay. yeah. You can get a Ninja Gaiden okay. too, so they literally do exactly what you do. Oh, I heart Ninja Gaiden. Yeah, too. but imagine that those clones can get hit by enemies. Oh, that's that's no. it's really really frustrating that would in, be in complicated areas. Yeah. The rescue has a really interesting bonus level that looks a lot like Star Fox, but it's not using any special technology. It's just the hardware processing to do the uh, the 3D effects, and you know it's like a scrolling on rail shooter almost. Yeah, even the graphics look almost like Star Fox graphics. You know, they've got the gray shaded um, ship, except the wings are a little more triangular than the than the R-Wing ships are, but a lot of it looks really, really similar. Is there, like, really crappy voice acting? No like, crappy voice acting. No. Incoming enemy fighters, prepare for launch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what it just sounds like. It sounds like the the voice from Charlie Brown, like the mom. Or the, yeah, all the adults. <laughs> Matt Furness has written amazing soundtracks for stuff like... He did, uh... Alien did, uh, 3. Alien 3. Alien, Alien 3, 3. Bill's Tomato Game, Hard Drive and 2. Zool 2? Or Zoop? Did he Zool? do... Zool. Zool. Yes. He did Zool he 2. Did we Zool. played Zool 2. That's um, right. Scott's Picks. On Scott's Picks. Yeah. I, I remember Episode that. 9? I mean, he's just done so much. Fido Dido, Lemmings 2. He did a lot of conversions, like Lion King and Mickey Mania. He did a lot of conversions from other people who have done music and then converted them to the Genesis. Wolfchild. Wolf Child. Wolf Child. It's a good one. Wolf Child was a really good Sega Genesis game. The soundtrack was excellent. I actually prefer the Genesis version of the soundtrack to any of the others. Because it did come out on Super Nintendo and Sega and CD. And Sega CD, yeah. And they all yeah, have yeah. three different soundtracks, I want to yeah. say. The Sega CD version was very kind of mellow, yeah. almost, if I remember correctly. Yeah. It's kind of like elevator music. The Sega Genesis one was the most upbeat, I would say, of the, yeah. of the three. Yeah. No. So anyways, yeah, Furnace has written a lot of games which never came out. Um, a lot of them had really awesome soundtracks, and you can find them nowadays, like Fun Car Rally and Rescue, and, and, and then the Fido Dido game, which I mentioned before. So. You said Fido Dido. Tomato Game. That one. Yeah. I don't know. On the webpage I'm looking at, it, it claims Bill's Tomato Game was released. It was released on Amiga, that's but right. not okay. on... On Genesis, that must or be Mega where that came from. Yeah, Bill's yeah. Tomato Game, and then Pugsy. Pugsy's actually one of my favorite Furnace soundtracks. Oh as yeah, well. Pugsy, Pugsy's it's a cool show. game. Genesis, I did, yeah, and Sega CD. I had okay, the Sega CD version, but yeah, yeah, like early physics puzzler game. Okay, yeah, really good stuff. Or, so, anyways, let's get on with the show. This is the first level theme for the first level music from Rescue by Matt Furnace.
Welcome back. That was our last track of this episode. It was from Ninja Gaiden, the unreleased Sega Genesis version. Yeah, I was actually really surprised to hear that this game was even in, in existence. Mm-hmm. I didn't know about it until very, very recently. You know, I would think that a franchise as popular as Ninja Gaiden on a console that was doing as well as the Genesis, like the combination would have just meant that the game would have come out. It was developed by Tecmo. I don't exactly know what happened as far as what made this game get canned so early on. This was a beat em up, right? This was not like Correct. more like the arcade version. Much more like, like the arcade version. It was more like an enhanced version of the original arcade okay. game. Okay. Ugh. Yeah. But. <laughs> Barperoni and cheese. <laughs> I'm a sucker for the Nintendo ones. I just wish they left in the. Uh, the Iron Man music during the bosses. Uh, <laughs> and the death scene. I love the the death scene in that game where it's like there's like um, a rotating gear or something. Or it's like what is it? It's coming down on our hero though, and it's about to cut through him. It's like a spinning blade. There we go. Yeah, like a pendulum blade. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like a guillotine? Like, not really. No. Well, it's like, like a, a large pizza cutter <laughs> with much sharper blades. We'll go with that. Yeah, we'll that go works. with the pizza cutter. The actual composer for this game isn't known, but we do know that it was written by Goblin Sound, who nowadays are uh, known as Opus, and known employees of Goblin Sound are Kei Hasegawa, Hiro Nakayama, Hiroshi Suzuki, Takeyuki Suzuki, Hiroshi Taguchi, Hisashi Yatsumoto, Masaneo Akahori, Jun Inoki, Hiro Nakayama, Satoshi Ota, or Takeyuki Suzuki. So one of those people Jeez, wrote the music to this game. People. I just wanted to throw them all out there, so I'm sure I give them proper credit. So yeah. one of those like 11 or so Japanese composers wrote the music for this game. The music is really good. Mm-hmm. The game itself is very rough. You cannot actually run straight in this game. Mm. So if you press forward to go from left to right, you actually will run at a diagonal downward angle. Does that mean like you're you're so you see run homosexually? It's it's, <laughs> it's it's not it's not listen. <laughs> I'm just I saying. don't even know what that means. <laughs> you're just like I just thought this was a, a running off a cliff simulator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, saying. and if you run too far to the bottom of the screen, you literally fall off the screen. It's like a, and you can either get stuck or you die. It's like in Bit Trip Runner. When you run, you have uh, rainbows behind you. Yeah. Like that. No, nothing like that. Okay. No. Right. There's no gayness in this game whatsoever. <laughs> He's a ninja, man. <laughs> ninjas don't have any sexuality. I don't He's think ninjas ninja. get married, even though their girlfriends get stolen all the time. That's but, true. What's up know? with that? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta focus your body on training, not on loving. Yeah, that's true. You know. But why do they even have girlfriends then? Because stories. Yeah, because because stories. You gotta have somebody to rescue, <laughs> right? Because right. stories, because Mike. stories. God, because this is the way that you can't just restore work. your family's honor. You have to rescue a yeah. too. I mean, Ryu had Irene, you know. Yeah, yeah true. So, true. I don't know. But anyway, so yeah, this this game, I actually did beat it, getting stuck numerous times because, like I said, you could fall off the level, you could fall off the screen, you can actually kick enemies off of the screen so that they get stuck, and then you're just kind of waiting for the screen to be able to let you progress further on and it just doesn't go anywhere so you're pretty much just stuck there listening to the awesome music and then you've got to hit that reset button and start over again sega ninja gaiden is not my ninja Gaiden. no it's not my ninja gaiden either no although the master system game was pretty good yeah the the master system game is amazing yeah the one that came out only in europe the only problem i have with that game is when you're moving and you go through like you, you know you hit the end of the screen you know how like in mega man or even like in ninja gaiden There'll be like something that will transition you from screen to screen. This one, no. The Master System game, you're just like, and next screen. It's like there's no, like you could easily fall down a pit without even realizing it because they'll just put a pit right there. So that's yeah. the kind of stuff that always made me mad. It's about one of those game. kind of memorization deals. Oh, absolutely. It's like our type where you need to oh, yeah. memorize the level to get through it successfully. Mm-hmm. But with this one, you know, the combat wasn't even that great. It really? was punch, punch, kick, punch, punch, kick. You know, you couldn't Very really rep- mess up your combos or yeah. mix them up or anything. Mm. So it got kind of boring after a while, but I really wanted to get through the game because there are cutscenes in there and they actually are in English for some strange reason. Wacky. But, you know, the story isn't really anything. He's just, he's looking for the bad guy and he finds the bad guy. The yeah. bad guy isn't really the bad guy that's in control, so he sends him to another bad guy. He beats the bad guy and then goes back to Japan. You literally beat his father? That's spoilers. No. No, I don't think he beats up his father. You literally just explained the plot of Link to the Past. 
Yes, I did actually. You, you did. I did. Yeah. He goes to the bad like, guy. He goes to the bad guy. He doesn't but... go back to America. No, he does. <laughs> he go, no, he goes back to Japan at the end of like spoilers. Uh, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> you literally. That's so funny. <laughs> he goes. He goes and tries to be the bad guy, but it's not the real bad guy. So then he goes after the real bad guy. And then he goes back to Japan. Goes back to Japan. Hyrule Japan. Nippon Japan. <laughs> no, Nippon Hyrule. Hyrule Japan. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, so that's going to do it for the last track, and that's going to do it for this episode of Legend Legends of Ninja Gaiden. Legend of Ninja, Ninja to the Past. <laughs> <laughs> that's the final option. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to thank Aaron from Retro Obscura. Thank you again for joining us on this magical quest that was never released. Yeah, if you want to check out Aaron's music, you can hit soundcloud.com slash diagamblic. Is that how you pronounce it? Because I've never actually heard it pronounced out loud. (laughs) It's diagamblic. It's just... uh... (laughs) It's two words mixed together, diabetic and gambler. So oh, smash it together, and that's what you get. You get okay. You're doing the G-I-A-A. little Famicom portmanteau there. <laughs> we'll post. We'll post links in uh, obviously the Facebook and the YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, do you want to? You want to talk about your music a little bit? Yeah. So I, I really enjoy the stuff you do. So yeah. So I do chip tunes for different systems. I make NES music, Genesis music. Um, I even do some like Commodore 64 type sounding stuff. And uh, you know, I do like. Mixes of real instrumentation mixed with some of the chip stuff. So, um, yeah, I do different styles, you know, rock and more electronic stuff. So, just check it out and enjoy. I need to get this guy on my dude, you haven't played this game if that's the case. I need to do some remixes. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Because, uh, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. Ah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, because Nickelbuck isn't doing music for it anymore, so. Yeah, I mean, he's he just came out with that game Sports Ball, which, speaking of, if, if you want to hear about games that actually did get released, um, you guys should go check out my buddy's new game, uh, Nickel Punk, actually just did a game called Sports Ball, and it's out on the Wii U, and it's an indie title. Another buddy of mine who also worked on it, uh, his name is Austin and really cool guy so they came out with this game and they did a really awesome 80s centric type commercial uh with a female football player actually it's really cool stuff cool and they show off a little bit of gameplay footage so definitely go check that out as well if you are a wii u owner speaking of buddies with games coming out uh whoa dave is finally out yeah i i saw that yeah Yeah. so we we played that back on our indie show a couple episodes ago yeah it's getting fantastic reviews you can pick it up on ios or 3DS. I've got it on both, and the game is just so much fun. Cool. Really, really. Did he a take blast my play. my hint for the theme? No, there's no. Dun, 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 Whoa, Dave. Dave! No, no, there's no theme song like that. Oh, that's awesome. He did take it under consideration. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, he actually did. No. But. Okay. <laughs> he should have. No, because but it's, the it's, game would have been a million seller. Yeah, it's We're definitely sticking, worthwhile. Uh, sticking Dave's theme from Maniac Mansion. Just throw it in there. No, 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 no. That's not. That's not Dave's theme. Oh, that's I the love one that, that sounds like mentioned. boys are back in town. That's, that's right. One. Yeah. 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 Da, 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 da. yeah. All right. I remember. Yeah. yeah. We got to play some Maniac Mansion. Music I think we should just have an episode where you just sing Maniac Mansion. Songs. What do you I think? should just hub along to Maniac Mansion. <laughs> episode twenty-three. Maniac Mansion. Yeah. Hub along. Yeah. No, but we should do uh, we should do a George Sanger episode. Yeah. Because he did Funhouse and, and Maniac Mansion and a bunch of really good The Rocketeer. Oh yeah. NES. NES. Yeah. Yeah. That was a uh, good game. All right. Well, we're getting off track as usual. Oh man, we but, can't even say goodbye without making things move right into the dumpster. Once again, thank you, Mr. Aaron Hickman, for joining us today. We had a blast talking with you. No problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And we will be back in a couple weeks. We haven't even talked about our next episode yet, so we'll be sure to throw together something awesome. I'm thinking we're just going to keep playing. How about we do released games next next to this episode? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can guarantee the games will all be released. <laughs> so that is as much as we can tell you about episode 23. But uh, <laughs> thanks for listening and good night. Ciao, amigos.